Did you know 65% of Americans make New Year's resolutions while only 9% successfully achieve them? Have you made yours? According to health and wellness professionals, the best resolutions to make are the ones that take about 10 minutes or less out of your day. Hello, this is Dr. Rebecca Pilly. Welcome to an all new episode of the Wellness Minute. To kick off the new year, we have three special guests in the studio today to help us get off to a good start with our New Year's resolutions. If you are a practitioner in the current medical system and are looking for a foundation to build an integrative health practice, then we have exciting news for you. This fall, Maryland University of Integrative Health is excited to present a new program in integrative health studies. Do you want to start addressing the root causes versus the symptoms? Do you want to reconnect with your patients? Then visit the MUIH website to learn more about this new program. Be on the forefront of the paradigm shift in medicine. Hello again and Happy New Year. Let's start our new year off right with our first special guest, Carla Johnston, a clinical nutritionist in the Natural Care Center at the Maryland University of Integrative Health. Carla is here to talk to us about nutrition and health-related New Year's resolutions along with tips and tricks to stick to our goals and stay motivated. Welcome, Carla, and Hi, thanks Rebecca. for being on the show. Hi, Rebecca. It's good to be here. Well, you know, when we talk about New Year's resolutions, often we think about losing weight. So when you're here today, we'd like to expand that conversation and talk more about health and nutrition. And how about if we start with fad diets? Fad diets get a lot of attention in the beginning of the new year primarily because they're in the news from either a celebrity endorsement or someone who has successfully lost weight on a diet. What I would say is really pay attention to what your personal goals are because mm. each diet doesn't necessarily work for each person. We all have different dietary needs. And so as an example, on some of the diets where higher protein is a big component of that diet, if your body isn't able to process those proteins as much, that might be one that you might want to stay away from. So it's really about the individual, what works for that one person. It really is. Okay. Well, since fad diets aren't the best option to follow for a lot of people, what would you suggest? So the first thing I would suggest is listen to your body. So if after a meal you're starting to feel sluggish or you're not feeling so well, or it's taking you um, less time to be hungry again, and you take a look at what you're eating, you can kind of shift from there. Especially if you're feeling bloated or you might have a headache, um, those would be the types of foods that you might want to stay away from, and then you can kind of experiment on those foods that do make you feel well and give you energy. Okay, so really tuning into your body and listening to it. Absolutely. Okay. So the thing about fad diets is there's um, it's a result-driven activity. So you're, you're supposed to see something at the end, like lost pounds. When you're really tuning into yourself, how else would you measure it besides losing weight? So when you're eating well and you have energy, most often you're going to be moving more. And eating well and moving more most often results in lost pounds and more importantly, feeling well. So the better you feel, the better your choices, the better you move, and that just is better health all the way around. Okay, great. So in our culture, fast food has become a staple for a lot of people with busy schedules at work and at home, and it really makes it difficult to prepare food. You know, uh, one of the things I might not like to do when I get home from work is go into the kitchen. Sure. So do you have any suggestions for how we can work around that? Yeah, I call it my three Ps. I say plan, prepare, prevent. And with planning, I mean planning what meals that you may be wanting to prepare over the next couple of days or perhaps a week. And also plan when you want to make those meals. And then with preparation, it would be nice if you had a day or a couple of hours or even an hour where when you prepare a meal, it's for multiple meals. So for example, if I were to roast a chicken and roast vegetables, that would be my meal one. And then in meal two, I could take those same ingredients and maybe add a good broth. And mm -hmm. now I have some soup 
and then take those ingredients at the end of the week and maybe make a casserole or freeze those for later time. And what that does is it prevents those days where when you come home and you have no time um, to prepare a meal, you might have something already in the freezer or already in the refrigerator ready for you to eat. Well, that makes a lot of sense. So I just want to say those three words again, plan, prepare, and prevent. That sounds very doable. It's easy to remember. Great, okay. So when we're uh, thinking about eating healthier and, and more whole foods, uh, the processed foods are, are just pr so prevalent. Yeah. So what are some tips for that? So when you're going through the grocery store, I look at labels in two ways. The front of the label for me is the marketing. It's to get you to buy the product. The back of the label is really what's telling you what's inside the product. And I always say know your number. So just as an example, if it has sodium at 1,500 milligrams, 1,500 milligrams of sodium is less, a little less than a teaspoon. It's about 3 quarters of a teaspoon of salt. And so if you know that and you see something that says 3,000 milligrams, mm. then we know that's a lot of salt. And then you, you want to know the numbers that matter to you. So if it's sodium that you're sensitive to, perhaps it's sugar. The other is look at the ingredients. Can you name all of those ingredients? Can you pronounce all of those ingredients? And how many of them are there? So when you're looking for food choices, I would say the less ingredients, the better. And you want to make sure that you can pronounce all of the ingredients' names. OK. So the, the back of the package is really important. That's where the numbers are, yes. yes. Know your numbers. So um, if I was going to uh, want to make some changes, uh, is it possible to work with both a nutritionist and, for example, a health and wellness coach? Yeah, practitioners work together based on the needs of the person who's coming. So, for example, if someone needs to make some small shifts in their diet or perhaps um, they're not feeling exactly well and they're not sure if it's food related, uh, it could be that they need additional support with sleep or with um, hydration or physical activity. Any practitioner that they decide to go with could be partnered with someone else to help make sure that they get the benefits that they're looking for. Okay, and we can, we can find those practitioners at the Natural Care Center. Yes. Wonderful. Well, Carla, thank you again for coming in today and talking to us about how we can get our New Year's off to a good start with healthier choices. Thank you. We'll be right back with our second guest, Sherry Lichen, a certified health and wellness coach. Sherry will talk to us about focusing on our goals for a healthier lifestyle and sticking to the changes we need to make. Stay tuned. Winter is a really interesting time because it's a time when the energy kind of comes down and people notice, for instance, that they get tired easily, they want to sleep more, they want to do less things, even though, like, you know, there's a lot going on in the winter time. Um, but if you look outside, you notice, you know, everything's colder, it gets darker earlier. So really the energy is a downward movement and time to really go inward and reflect. So everyone's chi is a little bit different. However, in general, um, during the winter, we do find that, again, it's a time of kind of going inward. And what happens is it's a time to kind of restore your resources. So the chi actually tends to kind of concentrate more in the body rather than being kind of that outward expansive thing that it is in the summer when the weather's warmer. And so it's really about creating your resources and, you know, kind of keeping them so that when spring comes, you actually have them for the higher energy that moves up. Um, I definitely would recommend, I mean, a number of things, one of which is, you know, eating warm foods because, you know, again, it's cold outside and your body needs the warmth, which can really just kind of help to encourage your chi to move and to do what it needs to do. I also recommend um, doing some forms of exercise, more of the gentle exercises like qigong or tai chi, which actually help to build the energy and really move it smoothly through your body, which is what we all want any season. And it's really important in the winter because I do think that we tend to push ourselves a little more than the energetics of the season and of our bodies would like. Um, Winter really is, um, as I said, it's really about taking care of yourself. And so it really empowers you to pay attention to your body and the needs of your body. Because your body is very 
uh, very aware of what's happening energetically. And so it really does have a tendency to, um, to want to rest. And so it's really empowering us for that own like self-care that we need and we often don't take the time for. Welcome back. Before the break, we spoke with clinical nutritionist Carla Johnston about eating healthy with some tips and tricks to maintain a healthier lifestyle. Right now, we have our second guest, Sherry Lichen, a certified health and wellness coach who also practices at the Natural Care Center at the Maryland University of Integrative Health. Sherry, welcome back to the Wellness Minute. Thank you for having me back. How was your New Year's? It was great. How about you? Very nice, very Wonderful. nice. And I'm looking forward to a nice 2019. So um, I would like to start with health and wellness coaching generally. For our viewers who are new to that term, what exactly is a health and wellness coach? Well, a health and wellness coach would partner with you to help you to achieve your health and wellness goals. Um, and. It's very helpful because behavior, you know, changing a behavior, changing a lifestyle um, that you've, that's be, been a habit of yours for years is really, really hard. And um, you know, we're all human and we all know how hard this can be. So coaching can really help you to, with that. Um, and the way that it can really help is, or the way that it would work is um, the coach would, would meet with you and help you to determine what's really important to you. And you know, what, what's the reason why you wanna make these changes? And really tap into how um, internally it, it feels for you. For example, you know, as opposed to um, because my spouse wants me to do it or the doctor mm. said so. Because it's uh, when you can, um, when you can align it with what's important to you, it really sticks. Uh, so a coach would help you to get clear on that and then to create a vision of what you, what, how would your life look and how would you feel if you got to that place, you know, if you were able to achieve your lifestyle goal or goals. So um, coaching is, is uh, if you look at where you are at one end of a bridge and where you wanna go on mm. the other, Coaching is, is the support that can help you get there. So you talked earlier about um, it, it's hard to make changes. What, why is that? Well, um, it's hard and you know, as when people make New Year's resolutions often, they, they don't succeed. Um, and that is for a variety of reasons of uh, usually, or often it's the goals are really not realistic mm. or not, um, realistic to just jump in, you know, a change takes time and you kind of have to, you know, it, it, it's more beneficial to go in smaller action steps so that you are met with success, which is how coaching kind of works. Um, also, when you, when you are not um, exploring the obstacles that you might face and having a plan for what you're going to do with those, that can also derail you. Um, and then, you know, as I spoke before about the clarity around the internal importance to you, that is often not explored. So, um, and above all, it's the lack of support. You know, uh, without a support, without support structures, it's difficult to make the changes you would like to make. So could you talk a little bit about what a support structure might look like for someone wanting to make a change? Yeah, sure. So, um, well, the coach is a structure, so the coach can help you to um, to be accountable for things that you want to try. And you know, on a, it's uh, it's important to know that it's a it's a safe space. It's I like to call it experimenting because people are afraid to fail, and a lot of learning comes from when things don't go your way. Mm -hmm. So. It's, it's a great learning process. And other structures of support could be family members or friends, or even um, using uh, uh, you know, post-it notes to remind you, or uh, there are a lot of apps that can help to remind you, or reminders on your calendar, for example. So there are many ways to create supports. Okay, well, thank you. That, that makes a lot of sense. 
Uh, one of the things I've heard a lot about is uh, mindfulness. How does mindfulness come into play with making changes? Mindfulness is really, really important. And so mindful, and aware, mindful awareness is really bringing your, your mind and body together in, this, in, that, in the very present moment, you know, in this moment, on purpose and without judgment. Um, this is really important because in order to make changes, you need to be aware of what's going on in your life. You really have to pay attention. Um, I mean, really, if you think, you, if you're, if you're just uh, not thinking and you grab something to snack on, when really what your body's trying to tell you is that you're just thirsty. Mm -hmm. For example, if you really tune in and you're present, you could find that out. Um, and also, what's really important about being mindful is it allows you a space to acknowledge your emotions because emotions are so normal and natural part of being human and when you are um, aware of an emotion you can you can kind of push the pause button and notice it and decide how you're going to respond instead of reacting yeah. um, quickly to it so um, y you know you really uh, it, it, being mindful through practice and you can do this just uh, I mean, I could talk a lot about mindfulness, but we really don't, you know, have the time here. But even just taking pauses in your day, whenever you catch yourself, um, you catch yourself having a negative thought, and then you stop and you, you reframe that thought. Over time, your brain actually gets rewired to think more positively. So it's a wonderful practice. So all those little things that you mm -hmm. can do can add up to a big change. Yes, okay. absolutely. Up next, we have one more special guest talking to us about a topic we haven't had on the show before. We'll be right back. Are you a sports performance professional, a nutritionist, a registered dietitian, or a fitness professional looking to increase your amount of knowledge in your area of expertise? Maryland University of Integrative Health is offering a new 13 credit online program just for you. Sports performance and integrative nutrition will prepare its students with the knowledge and skills needed to enhance performance through scientific and holistic nutritional principles and practices. Visit the MUIH website to learn more. We're back with another special guest. This is the Wellness Minute. Today we're talking about tips and tricks to help you start your new year off right. Our next guest, clinical herbalist Donna Kosea, wasn't able to make it into the studio today. Luckily, we were able to interview her about herbs that can help support a healthier you. Let's take a look. So I'm a clinical herbalist, and for those who might not know what a clinical herbalist is, um, a, a trained herbalist will follow what's called a functional medicine approach. And so what that basically means is, say a person comes to me with, with one particular issue, what we'll do is we'll, we'll look at all the different body functions, and some of them may seem to be unrelated um, to what you came to me for, but what, what our job is is to try to find those connections, and we look at the whole body um, because everything is connected. And, and so we'll spend a lot of time talking about all different body functions, and then once I get a more complete picture about what's going on, then I can take that information and I can start handpicking actual herbs that I like to use. Um, and a lot of herbalists, and, and what I was trained to do is actually to handpick a number of herbs and then I compound them directly. And, and the beauty of it is, is that, that I, can, um, I can compound herbs just for the individual. And, um, so basically what that means is, you know, if I have three different people that all come with sleep issues, they're, prob they're all going to get different herbs. Um, and that's all based on, you know, our discussions and what else is going on in the person. And so it's, it's very, very personalized. It's very individualized. Um, the other important thing to note about herbal medicine is, is that um, herbs are not used in a vacuum. And so we also look, about, look at and talk about, um, you know, other inputs in a person's life, you know, what, what lifestyle choices are, are they making, what, what food are they eating, you know, what are their relationships, you know, how much sleep are they getting, and all of these things are also really important in, in good health. And so, um, so my role is to partner with a person and, 
you know, hand select a number of herbs that I think are going to serve that person and also provide suggestions and recommendations on maybe some diet tweaks and some lifestyle tweaks. And, and again, it really is a whole body, whole person approach. A, a lot of times, a lot of a, a lot of overall healing really begins in the gut. And so when you talk about digestion, um, good digestion is, is often a key that can bring a lot of other body imbalances back into place. So, so digestion is a particularly good uh, place to start, especially in the new year um, when you're looking at, at um, good health and good health habits. Um, and so as herbalists, we, we a lot of times do look at digestion, even if a person is coming in for what seems like an unrelated thing. So as far as uh, what herbs might be good for digestion is um, just about any herbalist will tell you that uh, digestive bitters. Um, bitter herbs are just really amazing and do amazing things for, uh, for digestion. And they, they work by promoting the secretion of digestive juices um, really all the way from saliva uh, in your mouth all the way down to the hydrochloric acid to the digestive enzymes that are secreted in, in your stomach. And so unfortunately the, the bitter taste is actually a good a important part of the, um, of the medicine so it's really important to, to taste the bitters on your tongue because that actually does stimulate the, the digestive process. Um, as far as some herbs that, might, that you might consider for uh, uh, for helping your digestion. Um, one, one really nice one that comes to mind is dandelion root. Everybody knows what dandelion is, and, and uh, it's a very common, very safe herb, um, somewhat bitter. But another herb is, is artichoke leaf. And you know everybody's familiar with, with artichokes, but it's actually the leaf that, uh, that is very, very bitter, but, but provides that digestive stimulus to help promote good digestive. It, it, it heats, heats up the stomach and um, gets that digestion going. Uh, there are, of course, um, an, any number of maybe lesser known, um, you know, and somewhat more powerful bitter herbs as well. But but those are two that that um, you know are pretty common. A, a really nice thing about herbs is that, that herbs herbs are not, you know, a one trick pony. So there are some herbs that are typically indicated for sleep, and there are herbs that that are indicated for helping you sleep if you have this other problem. So so say for example. Um, a, an herb that I really like for, for really having some sort of pain-related sleep issues is California poppy. You know, it, it's known to have both some calming sedative effects as well as some analgesic effects. So, so yes, you're exactly right that, that you're trying to solve the root cause and you know, a single herb may do multiple things. And so you, you put this whole piece, this whole picture together and then you pick an herb that, that maybe touches on you know, a number of things that you're trying to do. Herbal medicine is not a licensed profession, and so legally that means that anybody could call themselves an herbalist with, with no training or a lot of training. And, and so one, one really nice way to, to know that you know, you're getting somebody that's quality is there, there is a uh, registered herbalist certification by the American Herbalist Guild. They do a self certification program. It's a pretty intense um, application process that goes to committee and then the committee of, of herbalists um, you know, decides whether this person demonstrates you know, the, the sufficient knowledge of herbs and then um, you are awarded a registered herbalist status. And so you could go to the registered er or the American Herbalist Guild dot com and you know, and go find a registered herbalist in your area is, is another way to do it. You know, you can certainly make an appointment at the Natural Care Center. I'm on staff there as an herbalist, so you could certainly make an appointment with me. I think, I think the New Year is just a, a great time to start taking stock of your health and, you know, where could you use a little bit of help. Um, like I said, herbs are great partners. They, they really, they help nudge, you know, you back. As you can see, herbs can be an effective support to attain and maintain your health goals. Thanks to Donna for that enlightening interview. Have you ever thought about studying acupuncture or about the ways that acupuncture can help with various conditions that support whole person health and wellness? Tune in next month when we talk all about acupuncture. Happy New Year and thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. As the leading academic institution of integrative health in the nation, 
Maryland University of Integrative Health puts great emphasis on education and research to create leaders in a quickly developing field. Since 1974, we've been combining ancient wisdom traditions with cutting edge science to inform our programs and expand into new areas of study. Our educational models are progressive in many ways. One of the most important is that we're looking at cutting edge research to try to figure out what is the best way to approach a situation, whether it's treating a client's individual problems, whether it's managing integrative care as a philosophy, whether it's figuring out how to deliver herbal mixtures so that people have access to them, whether it's solving healthcare disparities or advocating for the work that we do in the profession. That's an integral part of everything that we do. Throughout students' experiences here, we're able to provide hands-on learning and clinical opportunities to give them the edge they need to become strong members in the integrative health community, not only once they graduate, but while they're here too. At MUIH, we strongly value clinical hands-on experience. There's nothing that can separate you uh, more from the pack than if you can say, I've done it before. I've tried it out, I've had my faculty help me work on something, I've worked with actual clients, I have that hands-on experience that tells me that I don't just understand something in theory, but I live it in my reality. That's why it's part of all of our programs to get either clinical or some kind of practical experience in whatever it is that you're doing. We also believe in community and the power it has to mold a student's education. That's why each student is given a unique experience whether it's through mentorship within the programs or through their experience with the admissions team. We value community and make sure that each student has a personalized experience. Students' experiences are customized before they even get here. You're assigned one individual counselor who works with you throughout the process to understand what's going on in your life, what's motivating you to come into our programs, what questions do you have about those programs, are there any accommodations that need to be made, can you do it in your own way, in your own pace, and in what sense can you not, and do you have to conform to what else is going on in the system. Same kind of individualization continues in the classroom experience as well, and then also when students are in the care center working with clients, or whether they're in the field working in a corporate setting or in a business setting. Not only do we support students while they are here, but even after they graduate, they know that they are welcome here and have a community that wishes to see them succeed and bring health and wellness to the world. Our commitment to our students doesn't just end when they graduate. We want to support our students throughout their career, which includes helping them to innovate and to become entrepreneurs on their own. So we strongly encourage and support our students who want to build their own clinical practices, who want to venture into new areas, who want to grow exotic herbs or keep bees or do all sorts of things to make the world a, a healthier, safer, and better place. If you're ready to begin the journey of health and wellness and become an integral part of the integrative health community, MUIH is the place for you. Visit us today.